Welcome. In this video, we are going to talk about mental health, mental illness, and the institutionalization of people with mental illnesses, including violence by and to mentally ill people, and suicide. If this is something that makes you uncomfortable, then you might want to skip this video. But if you are comfortable engaging in this conversation, then welcome. I also do just want to list a quick spoiler warning for the following H.P. Lovecraft stories. The Rats in the Walls, The Whisperer in Darkness, The Hound, The Color Out of Space, and At the Mountains of Madness. With that out of the way, let's get started. If I am mad, it is a mercy. May the gods pity the man who, in his hallowedness, can remain sane to the hideous end. Come and be mad whilst he still calls with mercy. H.P. Lovecraft, The Temple Last time we spoke, we discussed how Lovecraft's writing evokes fear. We discussed the uncanny, how the unknown can cause uneasiness, and how this kind of fear leaves you with more questions than answers. If you haven't already watched it, stop this video, go down into the description, click the link, watch that video, and then return here. Because today, we are going to talk about what happens when you answer those unanswerable questions. When you're faced with terrifying things and knowingly, consciously step towards them. We are going to talk about madness. Madness is one of those words that can kind of mean a lot of different things. Sometimes it means foolishness, sometimes it means enthusiasm, sometimes it means anger, sometimes it means mental illness, sometimes it means being afflicted with rabies. It's not used very often today, and part of the reason for that is because it's fraught with a pretty dicey past. During the time when Lovecraft was writing, it was commonly used to refer to people who were institutionalized for being mentally ill. The institutionalization of these people was not good. They were often treated poorly, even to the point of their deaths. Because of this, MAD has become almost a slur in the mental health community. And so knowing this, I want to acknowledge that I am consciously using the words MAD and MADNESS in this video. These are the words used by Lovecraft, and while he isn't, like, a good moral standard or anything, it would be cumbersome and awkward to try to rephrase or reframe every instance of madness in his works. That being said, the concept of madness is still a complicated one. See, when it was more widely used, it was an umbrella term. It covered a wide array of actual discrete illnesses. You could be labeled mad for having bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or any kind of psychosis. You could even be mad for having epilepsy, a speech impediment, or being pregnant out of wedlock. So if madness is all of these things, what is the uniting factor? I mean, what do all of these things have in common? Well, during the time when people were being institutionalized for them, these behaviors and illnesses and etc. were not understood and sometimes even feared. Society in general, and even psychiatrists specifically, didn't know a lot about certain disorders or conditions, like what caused them or how to effectively treat them. And because of this, these conditions were stigmatized and feared. And when people fear something, they do everything they can to remove it from their observable reality. So madness in Lovecraft's time was kind of a catch-all for things that society doesn't like. Mad people are those who were pushed to the margins, ignored, feared, whispered about. So what does this mean for Lovecraft? Well, madness shows up everywhere in his stories. 
Many of his characters become mad or are surrounded by mad people. The infamous author of the Necronomicon is referred to almost exclusively as the Mad Arab Abdul al-Hazred. Madness even finds its way into the title of one of Lovecraft's most well-regarded stories, At the Mountains of Madness. Clearly, madness is an intriguing concept. So, let's get some intrigue. On the face of things, you'd think that Lovecraft would be using madness to stoke fear. Madness is something very unknown, since only you are privy to what's going on in your own head. In this way, madness is almost intimate. You don't know what it will be like until you experience it, and when you experience it, no one else can truly understand what you are going through. Madness is isolating. For instance, in Rats in the Walls, our protagonist travels to Europe to restore a decrepit old castle that has been in his family for generations until it was abandoned under mysterious circumstances. During the renovations, he learns more about his family's history and about the secrets of the castle. He also starts having odd dreams, and both he and his nine cats start to hear sounds in the walls. Rats. Eventually, he, a friend of his, and some archaeologists he hired travel down into the crypts below the castle to get to the bottom, literally, of the mysterious sounds. What he finds drives him mad. Now, I won't spoil what exactly he comes across, but after his family's ancient secrets are revealed, he blacks out and wakes up in an asylum, told that he was found crouched over the body of his friend, eating him. See, madness is weakness. It's not being able to process what you've seen or experienced, so your mind breaks. You see this time and time again in Lovecraft stories. In The Whisperer in Darkness, the speaker says that to visit Yugoth would drive any weak man mad, yet I am going there signaling that only mentally weak men would be driven mad by this trip. Or take The Hound, where the speaker and his friend are wealthy and cultured grave robbers who steal from the dead for the thrill of it, and because they are particularly fond of mysterious and occult items. However, this greed and decadence, this weakness of character, eventually leads them to steal a cursed charm which sends after them a demonic hound, or just makes them paranoid, we never know for sure. This paranoia, whether grounded in the real threat of the hound or entirely fabricated, drives our protagonist mad and leads him, eventually, to suicide. Or take the color out of space, where we see the effects of an otherworldly presence on the minds of an entire town. Anyone but a stolid farmer would have fainted or gone mad, but Amy walked conscious through that low doorway and locked that accursed secret behind him. They say the mental influences are very bad, too. Numbers went queer in the years after Nam's taking, and always they lacked the power to get away. Then the stronger-minded folk all left the region, and only the foreigners tried to live in the crumbling old homesteads. To avoid going mad, you have to be stoic, tough, strong-minded. If you're weak, or a foreigner, because again, Lovecraft is human garbage, then your psyche just isn't strong enough, and it'll break, and you'll go mad. However, that's not the entire picture. See, Lovecraft often pairs madness with something else, something more positive, something that any other writer would praise as a good trait for their character to have. For Lovecraft, madness isn't random. It isn't something that just anyone experiences in his stories. No, for Lovecraft, the people most susceptible to madness are teachers, students, scientists, artists, explorers, scholars, because in his stories, 
madness is linked to imagination. Let's return to the color out of space. In this story, we're getting a third-hand experience of events that occurred decades ago, during which a meteor fell to Earth in a small town outside of Arkham. This meteor caused havoc on the town, but especially on the area in its direct vicinity, the Nam family farm. Through the eyes of the protagonist, we're told this story by Amy, the neighbor of the Nam family, so this tale is going through quite the grapevine. <laughs> anyway, the meteorite disintegrated soon after falling, but it left a mark on the Nam farm. At first, it caused their crops to grow bigger and more vibrant colors, and caused the surrounding wildlife to do the same. Soon, though, it had more negative consequences. The large, colorful crops were revealed to be rotten inside, and the now monstrous-looking wild animals were very aggressive. There was also something in the air, and it caused the members of the Nam family to change, to act odd, to become aggressive, to eventually begin to petrify and then crumble into ash. When Amy finds the family in this state, dead and decaying or alive and crazed, he reacts surprisingly okay. He pushes past the awful reality of what he's seeing and is fine. But why? What is it about Amy that allowed him to confront some truly terrifying truths and come out on the other side not mad? Well, according to the story, it was really lucky for Amy that he was not more imaginative. Even as things were, his mind was bent ever so slightly. But had he been able to connect and reflect upon all the portents around him, he must inevitably have turned a total maniac. Amy's lack of imagination is what saved him from going mad. Therefore, having a good imagination makes you susceptible to madness. And there's ample evidence for this. Just look at Lovecraft's main characters. Teachers, students, scientists, artists, all people who are imaginative. All people who have positive traits, who are curious and intelligent. And all people who end up going mad, or worse. When Lovecraft was writing, madness was considered a curse. It was something that marked you as an other, an outsider. Within these stories, though, madness isn't so one note. It doesn't necessarily mean you're weak. It could mean you're smart and curious and imaginative. But what does this mean? The point of looking at madness within Lovecraft's writing is not to say that he was some kind of progressive who fought to destigmatize mental illness or anything. That just isn't the case. Instead, I wanted to show that madness is complicated. In Lovecraft's stories, madness comes to the feeble-minded. The weak people, the less intelligent people, the non-white people. It's a curse for them. But it also comes to the cultured, the educated, the curious. For them, well, it's still a curse, but what I'm getting at is that going mad isn't an indictment of your character. Unlike in the real world of 1920s America, madness wasn't inherently an offense. In Lovecraft's stories, madness doesn't just happen to the bad people. While madness is still an awful and terrifying experience, it could be indicative of your mental fortitude, of your intelligence, of your willingness to ask questions and to seek out the answers. In Lovecraft's stories, madness is almost an honor, a prize. So the question isn't who is cursed to go mad, but instead, who gets to go mad? What is it that leads people to become mad? In Lovecraft's stories, it's weakness of mind and spirit, but it's also imagination and curiosity. So what makes the difference? I mean, where is the line between a weak or strong mind? And ultimately, 
what is the point that Lovecraft is trying to make with all of this? To answer these questions, we need to get to the root of the problem. When we looked at fear, we saw that we are most afraid of unanswered questions. But looking at madness, we see that trying to answer these unanswered questions, being curious and imaginative enough to face the unknown, leads us to madness. So what do we do with this chiasma? What lies in this chasm between fear and madness? Well, that's an answer for another time. But be certain you want to know the answer. After all, knowledge is dangerous. This video was made possible by the paycheck from my college administration, who won't let me teach the way that I want, which is why I am making these videos in the first place. And by viewers like you, who donate to my Patreon, linked in the description below. Thank you!